record. We are right at seven, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And just a couple housekeeping items for those that might not have attended either of our past webinars. Um, this is webinar style and not meeting style. So everybody's automatically muted. Cameras are automatically off um, at the start of the webinar. If you have questions, there's a little raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. You're welcome to do that and we can unmute you and you can ask your question or you can utilize the chat feature and the question and answer feature. Um, both of those are also at the bottom of your screen. So we'll try to answer those live um, since this webinar is being recorded. Um, I've had a few of you ask about how to access the past two. Uh, following this webinar, we are going to be emailing out how to access the recordings. How to access the recordings. So Without further ado, I am going to stop my share and let Bethel share her screen. And we are going to go ahead and get started. Bethel is one of our master gardeners, and she's going to be talking about seed selection and seed starting today. I see just before we get let her get going, a couple questions. Um, Stefan asks about um, lavender seeds. I think Bethel uh, might be covering a bit about seed storage and she might be able to provide some tips as we get into the lecture. And Deborah, um, we do not have a class planned on how to harvest. Um, we can plan those as we get a little bit closer, but some of that information is also located on the seed packet that Deb um, Bethel is going to be going over. So everybody sit tight and we'll let her get started. Hi everybody, I'm Bethel Quick. I'm a West Virginia uh, University Extension Master Gardener. I'm also a master composter. And as you can see, I find to, uh, I think I'm a seed starter extraordinaire. Um, I'm not very serious about anything. So uh, please don't take anything I say <laughs> um, without a grain of salt. Um, Hopefully uh, you're going to learn something today. Um, I've definitely learned a lot over the last few years and I hope to share that information with you guys. Um, we will be taking questions all along the way. Um, there'll be points throughout uh, that'll work very well. Um, so if you can just text or chat your, your questions in the Q&A or in the chat box, or like Emily said, use the, uh, the hand raise function. We should, we should get everything covered. Um, speaking of which, we have a ton to cover tonight. Um, so <clears throat> let's get started. So hopefully by the end of our presentation today, uh, you're gonna be able to gather up everything that you need uh, to start seeds um, and apply different seed starting techniques. Um, you're gonna be able to choose different seeds and plants that are appropriate for your location um, and your lifestyle. Um, you're going to identify the proper timing for starting different types of plants and seeds um, and different ways in which to do that. Um, you're going to learn how to nurture your little seedlings into beautiful productive plants. Um, and you're going to learn how to choose and grow the best transplants possible to have in your garden. Um, so my garden is my children <laughs> um, and my plants are my children. Um, I also have children. Um, but I tend to like my plants a little bit better. They don't talk back. So have any of you ever started plants from seed? Um, how did it go? Did you, did you find it difficult? Did you find it easy? Were some things easier than others? Um, I know for me over the years, um, it, it changes. There's, there's times that I, I really, really do well with tomatoes and then the next year, not so much. Um, so, you know, I, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years and, uh, it, it changes, so nobody's perfect, and um, we all we all started somewhere. Um, but even when we are master gardeners, um, we still we still have oopsies. So the big question that I get a lot um, is why start seeds? Um, why why take the time and the effort when I can just go out and buy the plants? Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost is the cost. Um, seeds they're going to cost you pennies on the dollar. Um, most seeds are, are just a, a couple of bucks for a packet. Um, I do have some that are that I've spent probably closer to six or seven dollars um, for you know, X number of seeds, but they're rarer plants, and I would have spent a lot more um, to purchase the plants. Um, just just giving an example of the big box stores, 
even when they're on sale, they're still, you know, they're three for, for $10. For $3.33, um, I, could, I, could, I could grow a lot of plants. Um, second is the variety. Um, with, with the stores, you're limited. You're limited to what they have available. Um, with seeds, you're only limited to what seeds you can find. And let me tell you, there is really no limit. I have some crazy seeds. Um, that I've accumulated over the years. Um, another reason is uh, you save a lot of time. Uh, starting seeds allows you to get a jump on that growing season, allows you to you know, not sit and wonder, are my, are my seeds going to germinate in, in the, the soil? What's going on? You know, it, it, you see it, you see it, and, and you can start. I mean, I'm, I've already started a lot of my peppers. I've already started a lot of my herbs and flowers for the year. Um, a lot, a lot a lot sooner than, than you're going to get with the plants. Controlling the environment is huge. So when you direct sow, you're, <laughs> you're subject to Mother Nature. Um, if there's a cold snap, if there's a lot of rain, if there's all of a sudden really warm weather, um, bugs, uh, predators, <laughs> uh, woodchucks, and squirrels, and groundhogs, and birds, um, they, you know, they want your seeds too. So um, controlling that environment um, and, and controlling the way that you grow things can also lead to healthier and more productive plants. And, and lastly, <laughs> my favorite part is the whole I made this. Like, I love, absolutely love to, to create a meal with food that I grew. Like I started with this itty bitty seed and I turned it into my meal. Um, and that, that makes me feel really good. Um, it makes me feel good about teaching my children these skills. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit of pride. It's a pat on the back. So big one, right? What are you going to need? And the answer to that is pretty simple. It's whatever you got. Um, there, are, <laughs> there are setups that you can spend thousands of dollars on. Um, or you can just use some cups in your windowsill. Honestly, don't let not having something prevent you from starting. Give it a shot. Gardening is all about experimentation. First of all, you're gonna need seeds. Um, I'm gonna base a lot of what I'm talking about tonight on location 6A, 6B. Um, I'm in Harper's Ferry and I'm a little closer uh, to, to the 6A, um, 7 even, but you can go on farmersalmanac.com and find, plug in your zip code, find out where you are and find out a lot of different information. Honestly, most seed packets are gonna have a lot of this information on the back. Um, so you're gonna choose your seeds for a lot of, in a lot of different ways. You're gonna base it on the location, right? You're not gonna try and direct sow or start seeds uh, of a tropical banana plant when you have frozen winters. It's just not smart. Um, that being said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you not to do it because there's ways to do it. There are things I've grown that I'm not supposed to be able to grow um, as long as you know how to do it. And that's, that's another talk for another time. I'm just saying, don't be daunted. Give it a shot. Um, secondly, what do you eat? What do you and your family eat? Don't go growing potatoes and onions and, you know, leeks if you don't eat them. If you guys eat tomatoes and melons, grow tomatoes and melons. Um, also, don't be afraid to give different ones a shot. Um, you know, it's, it's really great to have that really nice beef steak, but there's some beautiful paste tomatoes and cherry tomatoes, and there's different colors, and so don't be afraid to explore. Um, you definitely want to take the time and read the packet. The back of that packet is gonna give you so much information. A lot of the times it's generic um, to just tomato or to potato or to onion, but it gives you a good idea of, of what, what you're looking at. It's gonna give you germination times. It's gonna give you the growing conditions. It's gonna give you the days to your, your harvest. Um, someone had asked earlier about their, their lavender seeds. Some seeds actually need to be uh, put in the cold before they'll even sprout. So it's called cold stratification. And so seeds, you know, there's uh, lavenders and milkweed, they really benefit from being stuck in, in soil or even a plastic bag in your refrigerator for a couple of weeks before you try and germinate them. 
Um, another thing is, is scarification. So a lot of beans and peas actually benefit from you taking and nicking them uh, with a knife and, and helping to break through that seed coat. So again, pay attention to your seed packet. It's gonna give you a lot of information. And the fun thing is we live in the, uh, in the technological generation, right? So there's always the Google machine. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, GMOs and organics and hybrids and open pollinated. Um, I'm gonna bring it up on the next slide. Um, I don't want you to think that I, I, I skipped over that. Um, it requires a little bit more than just a bullet point because um, there's a lot of information. Um, and as I was saying to Emily earlier, there's, there, there's a lot of debate um, and there's just, uh, so we're not, we're not gonna stay on it too long. I do have a handout that she's gonna email to you guys. Um, so, so hopefully that gives you some more information. Um, finding your seeds, uh, you know, big box stores are definitely a way to go. Hardware stores, grocery stores at this time of year. Uh, my favorite is catalogs. Uh, in December, I start getting all of my catalogs and I can start dreaming of a green spring. Um, you know, it's, it's lovely. Uh, the extension does grow this every year. You can get seeds uh, that, that go along with that. Uh, you can always swap with your friends and neighbors. Uh, if you go online, I know on, on Instagram, and there's a lot of people that host seed swaps. Uh, I've got some really great seeds over the years from that. And then, of course, once you get going, you can save your own seeds, which is really ph phenomenal. Um, and we won't talk too much about how to save your seeds. Um, that's, that's another talk for another time. Um, but it's definitely a way to, uh, to get more seeds. So we're going to talk a little bit about seeds, right? So there's organic seeds, there's treated seeds, there's open pollinated seeds, there's heirloom seeds, there's hybrid seeds, there's uh, genetically engineered, and there's uh, genetically modified. So please take my information um, with what you will. Grow what you want to grow. Um, I'm going to give you my opinion on some of these things. Some of them are facts, and I, I will let you know what's the facts and what are opinions. Um, I personally choose not to spend money on organic seeds. Um, so basically, you know, uh, organic seeds are seeds that are grown and they're processed. Um, they're processed. Uh, according to the USDA's National Organic Program. Um, basically, it means, uh, here, let me, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, it's the, it assures gardeners the seeds were grown without the use of synthetic fertilizers um, and pesticides or genetically engineered seeds and materials. Um, if that matters to you, go ahead and spend the money on your organic seeds. Um, it doesn't matter to me so much. I am predominantly an organic, an, an organic gardener. Um, but you'll, you'll see throughout this talk that I do use synthetic methods at, at times. Um, I would rather spend the extra dollar or two that organic seeds are going to cost me on another pack of seeds. But again, personal preference, if you choose to buy organic, buy organic. Treated seeds. Um, treated seeds are going to be coated with a chemical, uh, most likely a fungicide or a pesticide. I don't tend to buy treated seeds that often. Um, again, I tend toward that, that more organic type growth, but uh, I have used them in the past. Um, typically when they, they will be noted, you're not gonna get these in, in your seed packets at the grocery store. Um, these are going to be uh, seeds that you purchase from, from particular sites and they will always be labeled treated and they will say treated for, and they'll let you know. Um, some of them, you know, are, are, are the, the ones that I've used in the past have been for peas, um, and that's mostly with the fungicide. So again, it's a personal preference. This is something more for uh, commercial gardening and, and commercial farming, uh, but it is something that you as a home gardener can find and use should you choose to. Open pollinated seeds, um, those are the ones that are pr produced through completely natural pollination. Um, humans don't help. We are, uh, the, the, the seeds that you save from these are gonna be exactly the same every time. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is your, your, your bees and, and, and your, and, or you know, the self-pollinating. That's what open pollination is. Heirloom seeds are open pollinated seeds. 
uh, that the, the varieties that have been passed along across generations, years and years and years and years. Um, they are stable. You know that it's going to be the same thing every time. Um, a fun thing is that all heirloom seeds are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated seeds are heirloom. Um, heirloom seeds can definitely be saved to grow again, um, and you will get consistent results. Hybrids. So hybrids are also known as F1. Um, hybrids are produced by cross-pollinating different varieties uh, within the same species. Um, so these occur because breeders wanted plants uh, with a desirable trait. So these are typically going to have um, a, a disease resistance. Um, and uh, it, it's, again, these, these are technically, you know, humans have been involved in this. Um, if you save the seeds from a hybrid plant, you aren't guaranteed you're gonna get the same properties of the plant that you grew. Uh, seed saves will actually most often revert to the properties of one of the parent plants. So you can save them, but it may not be the same, the same plant that you, you hoped it was. Um, so here's the big one, uh, genetically modified organisms, GMO, big buzzword. You're gonna see it on a lot, of a lot of packages now. They say no GMO, no GMO. GMOs are very different between, but, but from genetically engineered. So genetically modified, uh, it's a very broad term. It re refers to seeds um, that are produced through any type of genetic modification. Um, it's, it's typically, you know, modern genetic engineering um, or through traditional plant uh, breeding. Um, so, you know, even talking these plant breeders uh, who are working with conventional um, or organically produced varieties, they select certain traits that are more desirable um, when making the same kind of selections that can happen in nature. Um, it pr produces a type of hybrid. Um, so again, it's, it's including uh, like adding disease, disease resistance um, to an open pollinated or, or hybrid uh, cross between two cultivars. Um, if you've ever eaten a seedless watermelon, you've consumed um, a genetically modified organism. So I think what a lot of the, the hubbub is, is people convince or they, they confuse genetically modified organisms, GMOs, with genetically engineered organisms. So genetically engineered, um, they're, they're, it, they're, the genes are um, incorporated directly into an organism. This is something not found in nature. Um, it is something that's altered, altered genetically in the laboratory. This is where you're getting the, the, the you know, Monsanto corn um, that's you know, modified to protect from borer damage, um, where you're getting the, the Roundup Ready soybeans and other crops. Um, it's highly unlikely um, that you as a home gardener are gonna see any packets of, of genetically engineered seeds um, in garden centers or catalogs. Um, these things are expensive, they require paperwork, um, there's patents, and it's, it's, yeah. So again, if it makes you feel better to purchase a seed that says GMO free, we promise, that's fine. That's personal uh, choice, and, and I'm not going to give you any guff for it. Um, it gardening is, is all about what makes you happy, and if that makes you happy, go for it. So again, we're, we're basing a lot of these start times on my average last frost, um, which in, in Harpers Ferry is May 4th. Um, I've, like I said, I've already started my leafy greens and my super hots. Um, this week, I'm starting a lot of my brassicas, my broccolis, my cabbage. Um, I'm also starting a lot of my regular peppers, my jalapenos, um, sweet peppers, um, my eggplants. And then the longer growing herbs, the parsley and the thyme. Um, come the beginning of March, I'm gonna start with those cooler weather flowers. Um, and then mid-March, I tend to start mine a little bit earlier because I have the room, um, but I start my tomatoes and my basils and oreganos. And then just a couple weeks before it's okay to plant out, that's when I'm gonna start my squash and melons. They grow super fast. 
and they're really big and I have a lot of space, but I don't want to spend a lot of time taking care of them. Uh, the moral of the story is you can start anything at any time. It just matters. Do you have the room? Do you have the time and the patience to keep watering them, to keep potting them up? It's completely up to you. Um, you can, and again, you can go on almanac.com and find, plug in your zip code, find out where you are, where your last frost is, um, and, and go back from there. And uh, the, 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 the golden rule is typically you want to start six to eight weeks before your last frost. And just again, pay attention to that seed packet. You're going to have a lot of information. If it tells you, you know, 40 days, you probably don't want to start that, you know, back in February. Um, you're you're going to want to start it closer to your frost-free date. Containers. Uh, so <laughs> containers are fun. Uh, you can literally use anything that holds soil. Um, nursery pots, seed cell trays, recycled containers, newspaper pots, um, soil blocks, peat pellets, peat pots. You can use, you know, your, your yogurt containers. You can use old solo cups. Those are some of mine. Uh, pop bottles. Uh, the, the, the one key is anything that's recycled, including your nursery pots and seed cell trays, which are both, you know, I even do my brand new ones. Um, I sanitize them. Um, in a one to nine beat bleach solution. Um, if bleach freaks you out, um, you can also just spray it with undiluted vinegar, let it set um, out in the sun and, and dry. Um, soil blocks are something I've experimented with in the past. I'm not a huge fan, um, but you buy this little contraption and it creates soil for you. Um, it, it, it's not something, it's supposed to be really great. I don't particularly care for it. Um, we could, again, go and experiment and see what works for you. Peat pellets, oh, I know I had one here. Peat pellets, I don't know if you can see this. I'll show you this later. Peat pellets are these tiny little discs that once you get them wet, they expand. Um, for me, again, not, not a fan, but every, every, I know plenty of people that absolutely adore them. Um, peat pots, I thought I had some here, but I, I can't find them. Um, they're not something I use very often. The problem with peat pots is if they're not uh, buried properly, they do tend to wick up the moisture, um, and, and that if, especially if you don't bury it all the way. Um, I'm not a huge fan. I do use them, however, to uh, do seed start and transplant seeds that don't like to be transplanted, um, such as peas. Um, but we, we can talk about that in a little bit. And then your growing medium. The important things, it's gotta be light, it's gotta hold moisture, and it absolutely has to be sterile. Um, you can absolutely purchase pre-made. Uh, you get the, the, the bag of, of Jiffy Grow, and it, they even sell it at the dollar store. Um, it's, they're, they're really great, especially if you wanna do something on a smaller scale. Um, I've learned that it's more cost-effective for me, plus I grow on a larger scale um, to make my own. And I use one part peat, peat moss, sphagnum peat moss, one part perlite, and one part vermiculite. Um, it's just really important that it holds that moisture, that it's super light and fluffy and airy, and it, it's gonna be great for your seeds. You don't wanna use uh, potting soil. You definitely don't wanna use dirt from your garden. Um, these can introduce all sorts of bacteria and fungus and critters. Plus, they're typically too dense. Um, seeds really want to be in that light and fluffy, brand new. They're brand new. They're children, right? And they, they you want to give them room to grow. Um, at this point, some people add compost. I don't. Um, added fertilizer is just not necessary at this point. Your seeds have everything they need in that tiny little structure to live and grow for about two weeks. Um, I talked a little bit about sterilizing your medium. The way that I do it is I take a big Rubbermaid uh, bin, I put my peat, my perlite, and my vermiculite in it, and then I pour boiling water over it. This kills fungus gnats, eggs, this kills bacteria, um, this kills the, uh, the any funguses that happen to be in there. Um, 
damping off is a huge issue for seedlings and there's nothing you can do to cure it. Once your seeds have been hit with damping off, there's nothing you can do, they're goners. Um, it's a soil borne fungus. Um, so we can prevent that a couple of different ways um, by sterilizing the medium to begin with, pouring that boiling water, it, it, it kills it. Um, you also want to you know, worry about when you're watering, not to keep your seedlings too wet because that's gonna contribute to it as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about watering. A place to grow. Um, again, whatever you have. Um, if, you, if you wanna go out and spend the money on a pre-made uh, you know, seed starting get up, if you wanna figure it out on your own, if you just wanna use a windowsill or the top of your fridge, um, there's there's different ways that you can make this so that you can no matter what your situation you can grow. Um, seeds require temperatures that are around 70 degrees to sprout. Um, some are okay with a little bit cooler. Some need a little bit warmer. And again, read that seed packet. It's going to give you a lot of that information. Um, using the top of your refrigerator, it's pretty warm up there. I've seen people put them on a radiator. Um, I personally use seed heating mats um, and mylar blankets. So mylar blankets kind of hold that temperature in. Um, and I, I line my, my seed starting shelves with those mylar blankets. If you're going to do it on a windowsill, again, it, this is not the best possible way. But if that's all you have, go for it. Southern facing, if at all possible, do what you can. Um, you know, you can try that shelf system with the grow lights. Um, it's definitely the most expensive option overall, but I've managed to do an entire grow room for just a couple hundred dollars. Um, you know, you, you, it's, it's as complicated or as simple as you choose to make it. It really is. It's not, um, it's not that, that big of a deal. Um, I will say this though, um, when we're talking about where to, to set your plants, you got to make sure it cold extra wet, like soaking wet or super dry conditions, that's going to delay germination. That's going to stop the growth of your seedlings. So you want it to be as temperate as possible. You want to keep it moist, but not wet. And you want to keep them nice and cozy and warm. Bethel, I'm These going to stop you right there. I think you're getting yeah. right to it, but just we have a couple people asking specifically to clarify, you are talking about starting seeds in your home, not in a... Um, greenhouse or a high tunnel. So that those are some of the questions. Correct. Um, and Danielle yeah. also asked about sterilization of those pre-made mixes like Jiffy Grow. Yeah. So whether whether you choose to, to, to make a mix of your own or buy that Jiffy Grow, Jiffy Mix, um, definitely, because you need to pre-moisten it anyway. And um, if you just go with, and I'm going to show you in a little bit about uh, packing your seed cells. If you just take that loose soil and put it in your seed cell and put a seed on top of it, those seeds are just going to fall right down to the bottom once you once they get wet. And um, so you want it to be pre-moistened. Um, it's also going to be easier for that that seed to pull the moisture from the pre-moistened soil than it would later on. Um, so no matter what medium you choose, definitely do that. Um, that, that seed sterilization with the boiling water. And Dawn just adds a couple helpful tips in the chats. Um, she likes to use K-cups as seed starters, which that's that's great actually, because you're finding a second purpose for them and you get a little boost. Yeah, you, you also, they all already have the drainage hole in the bottom from when you, you put them in the Keurig. Absolutely. Recycle as often as possible. You can literally anything that holds soil. Um, the only thing I wouldn't suggest would be, I've seen them and they're really cute, is having the eggshell in there. Um, unless you break up that eggshell before you put it in the ground, your seed's not going to have a good time. So um, it's, it's cute, but uh, you'll have to break up that shell or, or your seed won't be able to, to grow as properly as it needs to. Great, great tips. All right, um, and I'm actually gonna take a moment and... And your video is off. So if yeah. we're gonna stop the share. Yeah. I am about to, there we are, there I am. Okay, 
Um, can everybody see me? We sure can. You might want to stop can your share and that'll make you bigger. I don't want to be bigger. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to take a brief moment. Uh, I, I tried to figure out how to do this, and, and I'm going to try and, and do this the best that I can. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about how I do it, and then I'll talk a bit about different options. Um, so I use these 1020 trays. Um, you, you can honestly, you can even get them at nurseries sometimes. Um, nurseries will give you stuff if you ask. Um, even Home Depot, I know Meadows Farms says it all the time. Just ask what, what you know, what could it hurt? Um, but I use these um, and then I set the little seed cells inside. And I believe you can get 10 seed cells, six, no, 12. Math is hard. You can get 12 of these little six. And, and again, these are things that you can pick up from your, your local nurseries, or if you've already, you know, bought some, uh, just make sure that you sanitize them with that, with that bleach solution, because you don't know what kind of critters, even like from year to year, when I reuse these, I do the same thing, because I don't know what's grown, what kind of fungus, what kind of mold, what kind of critters, um, and you don't, you, you want to give your seeds the best possible chance um, of a good and happy life. Um, if you don't want to spend the money on that, um, Cake pans, right? Um, ask first. <laughs> um, cake pans work really well as that under tray. Um, you can get roasting pans from the dollar store. A lot of them even have the clear dome that you can use as a humidity dome. If you can see. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, and then, you know, the containers for for the seedlings themselves, um, egg egg cartons. Um, these these work well. I'm again talking about the wicking. I struggle with these uh, because I do find I have to water more often because the the, the cardboard uh, does hold on to the water and create that wicking, and there's a lot more evaporation. So you just pay attention, um, and you just you know put your little your your soil in there and your little seedlings, and drop it into your tray. Um, you can also use, um, if you have a lot of, you know, parties, solo cups, just make sure you put holes in the bottom for drainage. And again, put those in your tray. Um, cottage cheese, yogurt, um, the, the little Chobani, they, they do really well. You just have to stop and think about how often you're going to have to up pot. Something like a tomato that's going to grow pretty quickly. I tend to start in larger containers. Um, and that way I don't have to pop them up. But you also have to think about your space, um, especially your space under your light. And so take all that into consideration. Um, another option is strawberry clamshells. Um, they've got like the built-in humidity dome. You just put your soil in there. They've got their drainage holes and you put your seeds and you just set it into your tray. Um, this is just a, uh, an old tomatoes were in here. So literally anything, um, literally anything uh, can, can be used um, to start seeds. Um, I, I've, I've seen, you know, people use milk jugs, you cut off the bottom, you can even just cut it all the way around and you have a little hinge. And then again, you have your humidity dome built in. So if you've got it, and, and recycling is always encouraged, right? So. Uh, reduce, reuse. We talked about um, nice warm environment. This is a seed mat. Um, you can pick them up for eh, 20, 25 bucks. It depends on where you go. I think Amazon has been the best price for me over the years, uh, but you can even get them in Walmart for 20, 25 dollars. Um, I use these just to germinate my peppers and my tomatoes. And then, then I rotate them out. Um, but again, when you're using a heat source, you need to stop and think about um, watering and you need to water a little bit more often because th they do tend to dry, dry out the soil. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how when you are doing, this is pre-moistened and this is my personal mix. So it's, 
peat moss. Um, I get it in a giant brick um, from Home Depot. It's, I think, $15, and it gives me more than enough for the entire season. Um, I think sometimes even for the next season. Um, I also put it in my raised beds, though, so I, I go through a couple through the year. Um, I'm going to move this down. So basically, when you are starting your seeds, you're going to take whatever container you're using, and this is your pre-moistened mix. And so you, you don't want it soggy. You don't want it, you know, you, you want to be able to make a fist and water isn't dripping out. You want it to kind of hold its, its shape, right? But it falls apart if you, if you move it around. Um, you don't want a sopping wet mess. You just want it moist um, and, uh, and that way it holds water better for your seedlings. Um, so you're just going to take your container and you're going to put your seed starting mix in it. And then you just want to kind of, you don't want to force it down. You don't want to compact it, but you want to tamp it down just a little bit um, so that there's a nice base for your seeds to rest on. Um, and then you can put your seeds down and just kind of cover it up. And then you put it in your seed tray. Now that I've made a giant mess. All right. Um, are there any questions about that? questions. Allison asks, how much depth of soil do seeds need? That is a really great question. So that, see, we're going to go back to that seed packet again. Um, I know there's there's some rules of thumb that it needs to be like four times the size of the seed. I, I don't know about that. Um, typically, again, the back of your seed packet the back of your seed packet um, is going to tell you this is going to be backwards. Um, but if actually, let me go. It does say it's depth to germination right on the back there. Yeah, yeah did it there? Um, depth, depth, depth. There it goes right there. So, right. So if you can't quite see it, it says a fourth to half an inch, and that's a carrot seed. So those are very, very tiny seeds. It's definitely going to vary dependent on your seed. Um, and again, it's it's on the back. I, I will go ahead and, and share my screen. And I have um, um, I have that on, and we can go back. So if you if you see, it does say over here, um, you know, seed depth one eighth. And these and these are tomato seeds. Um, I guess there's something to that quarter. I, I've just always paid attention to my seed packet. Um, I figure they're the pros. They tell me how best to, uh, to treat my, uh, my seeds. Couple other question. Um, Mary asks about your ratio of peat to vermiculite and perlite in your mix. One part to one part to one part. So whatever that means for you. Um, I do mine in mass quantity, um, so I typically, it's it's probably a couple gallons to a couple gallons to a couple gallons, and um, as long as it's equal ratios, it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, if you're just doing a small amount of plants, maybe a couple of flats, then you probably just want to do a couple of quarts each. Um, if you're doing a larger, then, like I said, I, I do several gallons of each at a time. And Shane wants to know if you need to keep the temperature at or above 70 just during germination or during the whole process, which is also a really great question. That is a really good question. So a lot of people use humidity domes. I don't. Um, I've, I've always struggled with, with uh, mold and fungus when, when I use humidity domes. Um, but that, that can help with, with, you know, that, with that temperature. Um, I... For the most part, your seeds, they need to be warm-ish, um, but it's primarily that germination time. And um, particularly when you're talking about like your nightshades, your, your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, um, those are gonna definitely need to be warmer. Um, after that, like I said, after it germinates, um, it, you're, you obviously don't wanna keep it at, at you know, 40 or 50 degrees, but a nice temperate room temperature is fine. Um, my grow room is probably, I don't know, about 68 degrees. 
um, and, and my plants are, are perfectly happy. And we have, oh, let me get to it. Someone's raising their hand, but I gotta find them. Uh, I think they lowered their hand, that might've been an accident. And um, Brenda is asking for a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, Bethel, the one you last sent me just was missing a couple things. So if you wanna send me an updated one when we get off here, I can send that out with the handouts. And we're all caught up. All right, hooray. Okay. So yeah, so we're oh I'm gonna have to go pages back. Okay. So yeah, so I mean I was gonna show you a couple of different setups. Um so the one here, you know, with the the top lights and the, the wire cage and the flats is great. And that's pretty much what my setup is right now. Um I've I've taken a few years to get to this point. Um, I'm also pretty serious about my seeds starting. Um, and I also, I germinate seeds to, to sell, um, to feed my habit, of course. Um, but honestly, I mean, you see over here, it's, it's some shoe boxes and some styrofoam cups and a shop light. Um, here you've got one of these pre, pre-made um, that you can buy from several different, I know gardeners.com has some with the, the light and the, the tray and the humidity dome. Those tend to be a little pricey. Um, and then over here on the other side, you've got just the, you know, wine cups and, and on a windowsill, whatever works for you. Do not let your lack of, of super duper setup, um, you know, don't, don't let it hinder you. Give it a shot and add as you go and, and do, do a little bit of research. Um, you know, yeah, I can buy a, a, a set of shop lights at, at Home Depot. Can I find them on Amazon? Um, with, with the advent, and we'll talk a little bit about lights, as long as you know what you're looking for, you can base compare and, and start out as expensive or as cheaply as you like. Um, I, again, I, I, we have a full grow room and I probably only spent a couple hundred dollars over the years. Um, you know, every couple of years I do have to replace, um, my, my seed trays and my, my cells because they, they do wear out. Um, but you know, I try to re, re, reuse as much as I can. So just garden, go garden. Before we get further into lights, uh, Keely, I missed a, a question from Keely in the chat on how much water you use to sterilize your medium. Um, so that's, it, again, it's going to depend on how much you're, you're doing, you know, start, start, start small. Um, because, you know, if you, if you oversaturate it and it becomes, you know, too soggy, then you have to sit and wait for it to dry out. You know, start out if if you're making a gallon of the medium. I guess what, what do they come? They they come in in those bags. I guess it's, it's probably like five quarts. Start with one quart of boiling water. Mix it up. See where it goes. Stick your hand in there once it's cooled off. Um, stick your hand in there. How does it feel? Does it does it you know when you make a ball? Does it stick together when you release your hand? Does water drip out of it? So again, it's it's easier to add more than it is to take away. Um, so there's really no no perfect formula, um, but like I said, start start small, and you can always add a little bit more. Plant markers. Uh, plant markers are really important, um, so you know what you're growing. Um, you can use popsicle sticks. I've seen people cut out vinyl blinds pre-purchased. Um, just if you're going to use them out in the yard, if you're going to take the same markers and use them out in the yard, just make sure they're weatherproof. Um, I, uh, I've had problems, you know, over the years, uh, even the, um, the UV Sharpie, yeah, it, it fades in the sun. Uh, pencil works really well, uh, but my favorite combination, um, I use the plastic plant markers and a grease pencil, um, and that's what's worked best for me over the years. I can start with them in my, in my grow room, and I can move them out, and they're good for, for the entire season. Things are nice to have, but are definitely not necessary, right? Humidity domes, some people swear by them. Me, I've never had great success. A fan to move the air around to get those seedlings, you know, used to air. A spray bottle for misting, um, a watering can, power strip, timers. Really use whatever on, is on hand. Uh, you Use what you have and add as you can. All right, we're gonna talk about light, and this is gonna take a minute. Um, 
seedlings require at least 16 hours of direct light per day. And this is already germinated seedling. Um, seedlings need to be put under that light immediately as they sprout. I say that, um, and of course there are, there are uh, plants out there, there are seeds that need light to germinate. Um, certain flowers, uh, lobelia, col columbines, certain lettuces. Um, so again, remember we talked about reading that seed packet. The seed packet is your friend. Um, so the, the suspend your light no higher than four to six inches. Um, when I'm when I'm first germinating, my my lights are are maybe two inches above the top of the soil level, um, and then of course I raise them as we go. Um, the closer the light, the less chance you have for them the plants to reach for the light, and that's when you deal with legginess. Um, and we want stocky, healthy, thick plants. We don't want skinny, stringy, leggy plants. Um, the type of light matters. Um, your average incandescent um, or LED that, you know, your light bulb, your, you know, that you have in your lamp, it's, it's not good enough um, unless you fit the specifications. Um, there's a lot of different lights out there. You know, you've got your CFLs and your fluorescents, um, LEDs, and then there's full spectrums. Um, CFLs are great. Um, they work well with a reflector shield. They work in any light socket. That's, that's the convenient thing about CFLs. Um, fluorescent bulbs, obviously, they're going to need a specific type of lamp. Um, I've used T5 and T8 um, and even T12. And, and all that is is the size, the T is tube, and then the number is the size. You just need to know that number based on whatever your lamp is, whatever the light is, and how it fits that. Um, they're, you know, it's your average shop light. Uh, they're, they're cheap and easy to come by. Um, LEDs are super energy efficient, um, and they're way more cost effective now than they used to be. Uh, when I first started doing this, they, they were they were not cheap, and it, it was an investment. But I mean, I think my last round of lights that I got, I I, I think I got six shop lights for less than a hundred dollars. Um, and there's way more lumens per watt. Um, full spectrum for me, I think these are overkill. Um, you know. Plants need that blue light for vegetation and root development, um, but you know they do need the red for flowering and fruit. So if you plan on growing indoors year round, um, you know, and, and getting fruit and flowers from your plant, then that full spectrum isn't a bad idea. Um, because to use just a blue light, your, 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 your plants aren't gonna be happy um, trying to flower and fruit. Um, but um, like I said, unless you're planning on growing indoors um, and keeping them indoors, they're kind of overkill. Um, because well, you know, you get them going, you get your vegetation going, you get your roots going with that blue light in your grow room or your grow shelf or closet, um, and then you take them outdoors and then they get the full spectrum from the sun. So I got down here, you know, Watts and Lumens and Kelvin, oh my, uh, there's so much that's like, wait a minute, what are you talking about here? Um, Wattage is the old measurement uh, for brightness. It's not really useful anymore um, with, with the advent of new technology. Um, we use lumens now. Uh, lumens are the measure of visible light uh, that a source emits. Uh, something that has more lumens is brighter and more powerful. Kelvin is, and so lumens is important, uh, but Kelvin is what's going to matter the most. Um, Kelvin is the light temperature. So we've got 10,000, which is the closest to daylight. Um, you know, we've got warm light to cool light. Uh, and I can actually show you here. So you see warm light, and typically your house lights are in the 3,000 range. Um, but like I said, daylight is gonna be that 10,000. Uh, cooler blue grow lights are typically rated around 4,000 um, and warm reddish or you know, closer to three. Um, the most important thing is to make sure your bulbs are 5,000 to 6,500 Kelvin, right in that cool range, and 2,000 to 3,000 lumens. This is where your plants are going to be happiest. Um, so, so again, the, the 5,000 to 65 and 2,000 to 3,000, that's, that's what's it's the minimum. You can find uh, bigger than that, but they're typically going to cost you a little bit more and not really necessary. 
So just remember those numbers. And you can see here in this picture, uh, the light color. Um, it's gonna be on the back of, of any box of lights you get. And you, as long as that it's in that bluer uh, daylight, uh, you, can, you can use the light. Um, just again, you gotta make sure the lumens and, and, and Kelvin are correct. Proper light matters. Um, you can see here these, uh, uh, the broccoli on the one side, the one is just leggy um, and unhappy. It's stringy. That's not going to be a healthy plant. Um, and on the other side, it's you know nice and healthy. This, this the uh, stem is stockier. Uh, and then the other side, you can see these are the same types of plants. You've got pepper plants, or I'm sorry, these are these are bean plants. Um, the one side, they're just reaching for that light. Um, and then the uh, the upper the upper picture, they're they're stocky, they're healthy, they're leafy. All right, fertilization. So again, um, not really important the first few weeks. Um, all the food and energy that a plant needs for the first couple weeks of life um, are there in the endosperm and the perisperm um, and the cotyledons. Um, that's everything that's in that seed is is it, it, it's there. It, it's it's there to help it grow for those first couple of weeks. Um, now the you know, once once you get those first true leaves out, it's it's you know it's been a little bit of time. Now it's time to fertilize because now now this is the point at which the plant is 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 growing and needs it needs that that nutrition um, in addition to the photosynthesis. Um, the type you use is personal preference. Um, I typically use a blend of both. You know, it, it, you got to keep in mind <laughs> um, you're growing these things inside and. Organic fertilizers are, are kind of stinky. Um, so you got to think about that. Um, additionally, when we're talking about, you know, fertilizing, in this situation, there's no soil biome to feed. Um, so I, I feel, this is opinion, um, that it's okay to use synthetic, uh, but it's completely up to you. If you want to use completely organic, that's your choice. Um, if you want to do a combination, that's cool. And if you want to do just strictly synthetic, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, like I said, I do a combination. After you see that first set of true leaves, that's when you want to start um, fertilizing. Um, so I bottom water and what I do, and we'll talk about that when we talk about watering, but I use um, a liquid or a water soluble uh, fertilizer at quarter strength. Um, I just mix it in with my water when I water and I do apply that one time per week um, until transplanted. And every time you apply, I'm still I'm using that quarter strength. Um, I don't use full strength um, on my seedlings. So here you see the difference between true leaves and seed leaves. Um, those seed leaves are the first ones that are going to come out. Um, and that's, that's part of, of those first couple of weeks. But once the, you see those true leaves peak out, that's when you need to start fertilizing. And you can see here, fertilization matters. Um, on the one side, you've got the two flats. Uh, one, they're the exact same plants. One was fertilized, one was not. Um, and on the other side, you can see they were, uh, the, the very bottom ones were not fertilized and the top ones were. Watering. So again, going back to the, the seed starting mix, your soil should be moist, but not soggy. Um, I'm gonna remind you again about that damping off. <laughs> it's a so soil-borne fungus and it does thrive in wet soil. Um, so you want to check your plants, your seedlings often. Um, you can use that humidity dome or you can use plastic wrap um, in lieu of the humidity dome, but you only want to do that before germination. Um, once those plants have poked their little faces up through the soil, you don't want to use that anymore. Um, I use a combination of bottom watering and a spray bottle. Um, Pre-germination, I tend to use that water sprayer, that water mister. Um, and depending on what you're growing and your heat situation, you may need to do this two or three times a day. Um, I find that this works best for me just simply because I'm not disturbing the seeds too much by lifting up the tray um, and pouring that water in. Um, and again, I can just, I can monitor what's going on. I'm not gonna add too much. Bottom watering, it saves a whole lot of headache. Um, I recommend that you get into the habit of watering from the bottom, whether the plant is in a seed tray or out in your garden. Um, when, we, when we splash water all over the top of our plants, we can introduce a host of issues 
um, about you know when we get splashed back onto our leaves and we get soil you know borne illnesses on our our plants um, and uh, it just becomes a problem. Um, you're in addition, you're just you're kind of making a mess. And if you're doing it outside, spraying that water on top of your your leaves, you can end up burning your leaves once the sun hits them. When I bottom water from the bottom, I put it in that that tray that my seed starting uh, cells are in. Um, I, I set the seedlings in, and I remove them. The soil is moist. Um, basically, I let something sit for about 20 minutes, and anything after that 20 minutes, I pour out. Again, you wanna you wanna be careful. Um, you know that wet soil, moist but not soggy, and you want to keep good air circulation. All right, potting up. Are there any questions? We do have a couple. We'll catch up on. Deborah asks, "How do you feel about arrow gardens?" Arrow garden. Um, you know what? I, I've looked into it myself. It's it's a little pricey for me. Um, you know, I I, uh, I have two little kids that are very expensive, so I try to. <laughs> Emily knows now. Uh, I, I try to keep things as cost effective as possible. But I ask that if you if you check it out, please let me know how it works for you because I've I've uh, I've been looking at it for a little while now. And I don't have experience with them either, Deborah. So I'm sorry, we're not able to provide you with some first world knowledge there. Allison asks about using grow lights within a greenhouse. You know, I don't, I don't have much experience with that. So my greenhouses are just the pop-up kind. Um, and I have them, I use my greenhouses for more of uh, like hardening off uh, in the beginning of the season and then seed starting um, in the middle of the season because they do start seeds uh, for a second round of, uh, of crops um, about July, but uh, it's possible. I know a lot of people do it. Um, it, it especially at this time of year, it's gonna help. Um, you know, even on a cloudy day, the, the sun's coming through, but it's not as strong. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to hurt your plant, um, especially, especially if you're using things like LEDs or fluorescence, they don't really get hot enough. Um, I would, you know, if you're using a fluorescent, they do generate some heat. So I would just monitor your temperatures in your greenhouse a little bit more closely. Um, but other than that, I mean, it, it's just a, a second, uh, a second level that, uh, that just adds to uh, the stability of your plants. I'll agree with what Bethel said, Allison. A lot of commercial growers, um, depending on the types of plants they're growing, will use lights in their greenhouses, but many of them also won't. And the only difference is it just might take your plants a little bit longer to catch up without that light that's kind of mimicking the sunlight of the day and the length of the days that we get in the heat of the, the summertime. And Virginia asks about black lights um, slash UV lights in terms of so growing again, you know it we're talking about the full spectrum again if if that's something that that you're, you're going to grow indoors year round you know go for it me personally the only thing i use a black light for is in the middle of summer to hunt down those damn tornado worms um <laughs> the bait of my existence um so yeah fun tip uv light those little critters fluoresce and you can pick them off in the night um yeah so again um, unless you're planning on growing indoors and want your 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 plants to flower and fruit indoors i personally think they're overkill um there's also and, I, and i'm going to talk about this in an off-label sense um growing cannabis um, there's there's some some research that's been done regarding uh, UV lights and full spectrum lights uh, regarding cannabis, uh, but I'm not going to talk too much about that because we're not quite legal. Um, but like I said, there's definitely some research about um, happier plant happier cannabis plants that are being that are used because um, it's a different you're you know you're talking UVA and UVB and yes our plants need those things. Uh, but again, they're going to get that when they go out into the garden. And one last question um, for those of you interested in the arrow gardens, there's some really good discussion going on in the chat. But Danielle asks, when you say organic fertilizers are kind of stinky, do you mean they literally smell bad or they're just weak in terms of fertilization? Oh, no, they literally smell bad. 
Um, a lot of them are made, um, you know, from compost teas or uh, worm worm castings or fish. My favorite organic fertilizer um, is fish emulsion, which is literally ground up fish. Um, so yeah, literally stinky. No, um, your a lot of your your um, your synthetic fertilizers are going to be like the same in PK across the the board, um, which, which is fine. Again, we're talking about seedlings, and they just need basic nutrition. Um, when you're talking about organic, the NPK, um, and I won't get too far into that because we've got a lot to cover <laughs> and we've only got so much time, um, but the primary macronutrients that our plants need um, are, are in that and, and a little little different. So, so certain organic uh, fertilizers offer more nitrogen, certain uh, organic fertilizers offer more potash um, and some more um, uh, potassium. So it, it yes, but it, they, they, they are just as good and they're wonderful and I use them year round and, and whatnot, but they are, yes, ma'am, they are literally stinky. So if anybody missed the discussion on fertilization, we covered that in pretty um, deep depth on last week's webinar, which the recording link will go out here tomorrow morning. And um, we're going to turn it back over to Bethel. We're all caught up on questions to um, wrap up with potting up. Okay. Potting up. So this is the process in which we take our little seedlings and put them into bigger pots, literally potting up. Um, why do we need to pot up? So this is going to provide our seedlings with the best chance to grow stronger and bigger. They're going to feel less stressed and they're going to live their best life um, by potting up our seedlings into larger containers. Um, it enables their roots to continue to grow uh, without getting root down. Um, and that's when they tend to circle in the pot and get really unhappy. Um, when they're restricted to the point that they start to grow in those circles, um, they become tangled and bound up. And this reduces their ability to spread out and flourish um, after they're planted in the garden. Um, plant health is directly tied to uh, root health. Um, so this means that our plants are less likely to flourish. Um, now, they're, they're, if they're, they're slightly root bound, they can be loosened. But plants don't like that, um, you know. It, it, so it, it could hinder uh, the 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 health of your plants. So let's just start fresh and not not tangle those roots up. Um, another reason to pot seedlings up is that their roots grow larger. Um, they drink more water and they dry out more quickly. Um, so a small uh, six pack, you know, one of these little guys. Uh, full of soil um, is going to, um, you know, that are, that are just brand new seedlings are going to take a lot less water than a six pack of these with full grown plants. Um, they just require more. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, taking care of your seedlings is tedious enough. Uh, do you really want to be watering them today? Lastly, uh, potting up feeds the seedlings. Um, so, you know, you started those seeds in that straight seedling mix. Remember I told you, I don't add fertilizer. Um, you know, so it, they're probably hungry. Yeah, we've been feeding them once a week, but still, they need more. Um, you know, that seedling soil is fluffy, but devoid of nutrients. Um, so they're going to enjoy a, a richer, hardier soil. When do we pot up? So this is another one of those, eh, it varies. It's gonna vary depending on the gardener, on your situation and on your plant. Um, you know, what, what are you growing? Uh, what kind of space do you have? What kind of time do you have? Um, you know, if, if you got smaller containers, you're gonna need to do this sooner. Uh, but that leads to the question of why don't we start the bigger containers from the beginning? Well, if you start in, you know, if you start in this container, um, that's fine, but it takes up a lot of space and not everybody has that kind of space. Um, you're not going to be able to fit nearly as many containers on your heat mats and under your grow lights. Um, and that's pretty crucial during germination, um, especially in those first few weeks of life. That means less plants, which is never really a good thing, at least for me. You know what, if you're going to grow six tomato plants, then that's fine. Go for it. But um, tiny seeds and seedlings, they really don't necessarily want to be swimming in a giant sea of soil. Um, it's really easy to overwater when you're using bigger containers um, with the tiny little seedlings. 
Um, and the roots might also struggle to develop. And I, I know that sounds counterintuitive. You'd think, oh, more space. But no, they, again, they're really like children. They like, they're, when they're little, they like to be snuggled. <laughs> They, um, you know, they don't really like break free and want their room until they're teenagers. You know, they like to be hugged. Um, also, moving from a seeding start mix uh, into the richer soil is very growth encouraging. Um, and that's something that we would miss out if we started in bigger pots. Um, so another factor is, you know, tomatoes grow faster than peppers, right? So you have to think about the, the, the growth rate and again, go back to that seed packet. Um, you know, things, some things are going to grow faster than others, and they're going to need to be potted up sooner. Um, just, you know, start, start checking, start checking a couple of weeks um, after you've germinated and start looking, start looking at, at your plants, start looking at the growth, start looking at the roots. Um, if there's roots starting to poke through that drainage hole, it's time to pot up. Um, you know, how big is your plant looking? Is it looking happy? Um, you know when your plants look happy, you know when your plants are unhappy. And um, you know, if it's still growing steadily, then you're still okay. Um, also, like the timing matters, right? So if, if you're about to plant out, it, it's time to put your plants in the garden and it's only gonna be a couple of weeks, don't worry about it, your plants will be fine. And um, there's no point in spending that time and effort potting up when they're just gonna go out to the garden anyway. So that's a factor that you need to think about too. Like I don't often pot up my, my melons and cucumbers because by the time they're ready to pot up, they're out in the garden. So again, just, just monitor your plants. And that's just so much about gardening is just intuition and knowing and, and figuring it out um, on your own. And, and, and that's why it's so important just to get out there and do it. Get your hands dirty and do it. How, how do we plant or how do we, we pot up? Um, I was actually hoping to have some uh, plants that were ready. They weren't ready. It's been a little weird with the weather. Um, so I didn't have anything that was ready, um, but there we go. So you're gonna use containers um, that are about two times the size. Um, and again, stop and think about what your plant is doing and, and, and think about Again, those tomatoes, tomatoes versus peppers. I, I use this all the time. They both grow really well, but the tomatoes are gonna grow at probably twice the, the rate that the, the peppers are. Um, so you wanna use containers that are at least two times the size. Um, of course, we don't wanna be moving from those teeny tiny seed cells into a five gallon bucket. That's not really necessary. Um, now your soil for potting up, uh, you wanna use high quality. Um, you can use potting soil from, um, you know, from the big box store or your, your nursery. Um, I, I've often used a quality organic potting soil. Um, I like ProMix. I also like, um, it's in the red bag and I can't think of it right now. Um, it's just gotta be dense and textured and rich. Um, you know, again, the pre-mix is fine, but again, you're gonna wanna pre-moisten it. Um, so a lot of them are gonna feel damp to begin with. Just make sure that you can grab that ball and that it holds its shape. It doesn't fall apart and it doesn't drip water. Just like your children, you wanna be gentle but firm. Um, you, you, know, you want to just take your hand and, and you can see kind of in the picture, you want to you know, hold it by the stem. You don't ever wanna yank them out by the leaves or the stem. You just gonna kind of hold it. You wanna manipulate your seed cell or your, 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 and all of them should be flexible, right? And you just wanna manipulate it until it comes out. I've found that watering um, a couple of hours before I plan on up potting does tend to help the process. Um, so yeah, so you're just gonna keep a finger on either side of your seedling, um, you know, just very gently protecting that seedling, hold the, the, the pot and just kind of squeeze it and wiggle it out. And the seedling should slide right out. Um, there's, a, there's a technique that I've seen that I've never really done. I've always just dug into the, but they basically, they put a little bit of soil in the bottom. They take the container that the plant was in and put it in there and then fill the soil around it and take the container out and it's perfect. Um, I've not had luck with that. I just make my hole and sometimes you have to dig some out, but it is what it is. Um, and then, you know, you're just gonna, like I said, I, I just fill the pot about half full. I take my fingers and I dimple a little hole in it. I put my seedling in and then I pop. And then I tamp down just a little bit. You don't want to press hard. You don't want to compact it. 
but you just want to make sure that it's nice and firm and happy and where it needs to go. Um, okay, so um, burying or not burying. Um, there's a lot of controversy on a lot of these. Um, nightshades, I've had fantastic luck with tomatoes, with peppers, with eggplants, burying them. Um, I mean, tomatoes, I'll, I'll strip. <laughs> I'll strip all the way up to like the last couple of seeds or leaves um, and just strip down and bury it as deep as I can. Um, because it, it, the, all those little hairs that you see on the stem, those are going to turn into roots. Um, peppers, similar, but not as much. Um, and then the same thing with, with eggplant. Um, you know, it, it, just find a happy medium. You don't have to strip it. That's really drastic of me, um, but it's worked for me over the years. Uh, brassicas, your kales, your collards, your cabbages, you can do it. Um, you know, I wouldn't do it to the extent that you do with the nightshades, but you can, you know, just, you know, remove the, the bottom uh, layer of leaves and bury them a little bit deeper. Beans and peas, mm -mm. I've never had success <laughs> burying uh, beans and peas any deeper than they already were. Um, they don't like that. Um, to be fair, they don't like to be transplanted either, but I've worked way around that. But so far, I've not been able to bury a bean or a pea plant any deeper than that original root ball. Um, cucumbers and melons, eh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, again, most of the time with my cucumbers and melons, I don't pot them up because they're going out into the garden. Um, and so then once you have your plant in its new happy place, you're just going to water it thoroughly, whether, you know, using your mister or setting it, I find more success putting the water in that base container and setting your seeds inside, or your seedlings inside. All right, any questions? Just a couple. Um, Danielle asked for some clarification on burying in the context of parting up. So if you wanna go back, I think your, your fingers give a good um, context on what you mean by that in the top left when you're transplanting. Yeah. So when we're talking about burying, um, this is helpful if your seedlings have gotten a little bit leggy. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's totally safe for a lot of them. It's even preferred for tomatoes. Um, you know, like I said, that portion is going to actually shoot off. But you, you, you want to be just cautious um, about how deep. And yeah, like it, looking at that top left um, about when with a seedling this small, um, you you probably don't want to go any more than the height of your fingers. Um, you know, moving it out into the garden, your plants are a little bit bigger. You can bury them a little bit deeper. Um, but yeah, I think that that top the you know the the finger thickness rule uh, seems to be uh, the wisest. So she's adding Danielle extra soil when she pots that seedling up up to about that level to try and strengthen the plant. And uh, Virginia asks about CO2 in farmers greenhouse growers. So I can add uh, speak to that Virginia that's mostly done in larger commercial operations usually between the fall and the spring just as a way to help uh, boost the photosynthesis of the plant during a period when they're not growing super fast. Um, I don't know of anybody that does it around here they're usually very large operations because it's very costly to do so so they're only adding that CO2 into the environment to try and um, increase the photosynthesis of the plant if that helps. Oh, I didn't know that. Just another expense. <laughs> and we're all caught up. All right. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit um, how to choose seedlings. I know predominantly we've talked about how to start seeds. Um, a lot of people don't like to do this. Um, you know, they don't have the room to start seeds. They don't have the patience to start seeds. Um, it's just daunting, and, but they want to grow. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, to be fair, you know, I, I, like I said, I've been starting seeds for close to 20 years and I still purchase seedlings, um, mostly because I can't get enough of plants um, and, and I'm probably going to end up divorced one day because of it. But um, at the end of the day, you know, everybody needs to have an option, right? And, and don't, let, don't let not being able to start seeds prevent you from gardening. Please go out and garden. So surprisingly enough, you think, hey, I'm going to go into this store and I'm going to buy the biggest and tallest plant. No, no, not so much. 
Um, typically, if it's super big and tall, it's been there for a minute. Um, likely that the roots are bound and it's not as a healthy plant as you might think. Um, Additionally, the same when it comes to flowers and fruit. Oh, you get really excited. Oh, it's, it's, it's already, I've got a leg up, it's already started. No, you really don't want that. Um, you know, again, it's been sitting there for too long. You don't know how healthy that plant is. You don't know what kind of nutrition it's had. Stick to plants with buds, not flowers, um, and definitely not fruit. Um, check the roots. Don't be afraid to gently remove that plant from its container and check out the roots. Um, brown roots, um, roots that are crumbling, I've seen that. Um, if your potting mix is falling away from the root ball, um, that's a bad sign. If that solid mass of roots, it root bound, again, it, it's just been in that container too long. Um, you can also just lift it, on, uh, you know, flip it up upside down. If there's roots coming out of the bottom, and this depends, like if they're just starting to peek out, okay, you know, especially in, in the peak of growing season, you know, think, they're, they're going to grow quickly. Um, but if, if they're like hanging out of the bottom of that, you, you don't want to choose that one. Um, you're going to want to check the foliage. Um, you want it to have a consistent and strong color, uh, you, unless it's, of course, a variegated type, um, but, you know, circumstances, right? Um, you want strong leaf growth. You want to see that it's growing, that there's new shoots, that there's new blood, buds. Um, check the soil. Again, you want to make, you want nice, moist soil, not too dry and definitely not, you know, flooded and soggy. Um, you want to make sure that the soil is clean. You don't want to see algae on top. You don't want to see any mold or fungus. Um, you know, white fuzzy stuff, pass and move on to the next plant. You want to read the label. So just like you want to read your seed packets, read the label. It's going to tell you the type of plant this is. Is it open pollinated? Is it heirloom? Is it a heritage? Heritage is really a, a similar way of, of talking about heirlooms. Um, is it disease resistant? Is it one of those hybrids that's been bred to resist certain types of, of disease? What kind of light does it require? You know, you don't want to be buying vegetables that require eight hours of sun a day if your garden only has four. And you also want to take a look at the mature size of the plant um, because holy cow, I have totally done this where I bought a plant and didn't look to see how big it got and it took over my garden. Um, you want to look for hitchhikers. Insects, you want to lift up the leaves, make sure there's no bugs, make sure there's no eggs. Um, and you want, also want to look for signs of disease. Um, you, know, one, one, you know, one leaf that's maybe been damaged, that's a little yellow or spotted, okay, that's one thing. Um, but if you're, if you're looking at it and it just doesn't look right, trust your gut. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, if you're going into a nursery or even a big box store, ask. Ask, you know, when were these, have they been hardened off? Um, how long have they been here? Um, a lot of the time, you know, especially if you go in the middle of the week, they'll, they'll be very open to answering most of your questions. So you can see here on the left, um, you want to buy that stocky, healthy green plant, um, not the one on the right, which is, you know, kind of scrawny and, and it's tall and you think that that's a good thing, not so much. We talked about, you know, the, the root ball and the soil clinging to the root ball. So on the one side, it's nice and tight and formed. On the other one, it's crumbling away from the, the root itself. And here we're talking about that consistent coloring. On the left, it's nice and green and the solid color throughout. On the other side, it's some mottling, there's some yellowness. This could be a nutrition deficiency and you just don't wanna deal with a problem plant. On the one side, you can see a nice healthy root ball. It's ready to go in the ground. But on the other side, it's root bound. This has been in its pot for way too long. Um, a lot of people try and tease this apart and save this plant. I say, especially if you're purchasing it, it's not worth your time. Spend your money and get quality. Any questions about purchasing? None in the chats, just one on this topic on the screen. All right. So hardening off, um, <laughs> this is a deal breaker. Uh, I can't tell you how many gardeners I've seen nurture and love these beautiful seedlings for weeks. 
and then just stick them in the garden. And, you know, sometimes they, they, they make it, but a lot of times there's just, there's transplant shock, they're, they're sunburned, they're just not happy. Um, so the plants that we start indoors, they're used to being indoors uh, in perfect growing conditions. Uh, you know, there's no sunlight, there's, there's no wind, there's no rain. Um, so they're, they're delicate flowers. Um, we need to take time. And so about, you know, 10 days to two weeks before you're planning on transplanting them into your garden, you want to gradually um, introduce uh, them out into the world. Um, this toughens them up, it thickens the cuticle on the leaves, um, so they lose less water um, when they're exposed. And, you know, like I said, it helps to prevent transplant shock. Um, you know, and that, that transplant shock is, is when seedlings, you know, they languish, um, they become stunted, or they even die because of that sudden change. Um, so again, you know, you just move them outside um, in a wind protected area. It's fine if there's a slight breeze, you just don't want them being, you know, it took about, uh, for about three, four hours a day. Um, you know, you're gonna gradually leave them out longer and longer until you can leave them out for a full day. Um, you know, if, if your plants, if they, they happens to be a cold snap at night, bring them inside. Make sure, you know, you're not <laughs> gonna be devastated because, oh no, they froze. Um, alternatively, you can use a cold frame um, or a greenhouse. Uh, I tend to, like I said, I have my pop-up greenhouses and that's what I use. It protects them a little bit from the wind, um, a little bit from the sun, it gives them a little bit of shade, um, but at the same time, they're getting used to being outdoors and being in the weather and the elements. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Bethel has just a wealth of knowledge. She's covered a lot of information and I think she's done it tremendously. So I'm um, very thankful for her to have her expertise today. And I think every, we had some really great discussion and question and answers. I thank everybody for participating. Um, if anybody has out there, Deborah has a question. Deborah, I'm gonna, um, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Hi hey everyone. I um, just would like to go back to the arrow garden just to tell you th that when the plants come up, the seeds, the roots grow in the water. So when you transplant those, um, is there something different you have to do when you put them into the soil? If they're the roots are just used to the water, are they weaker? imagine so um I, i've done i've done some I, I i have minimal experience with with hydro and aeroponics um I've, I've just always had great success with soil so i've never thought to uh change it um yeah, but I, it for Christmas I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't imagine so again you would still want to harden them off properly because it's still going to be the same situation where um you know they're not used to those um, but as long as you made sure you were putting them into a sterile soil medium I don't see that there would be any issue. Thank you. And Linda asks for more information, um, a better description of a pop-up greenhouse. Uh, a pop-up greenhouse. Okay. Um, they are they are a. Um, um, let's see. Hold on, hold on. They're they're like a little frame that um, you you can put a plastic. Uh, cover over and um, they, they range in price. Uh, yeah, I've seen them uh, for, you know, $30, $40. I've also seen them pretty, pretty expensive. Let me see if I can find one here. Here I got, I think y'all yeah, can be able to see. Yeah. I had one that was um, just like a really small one that I'd keep in my sunroom to start my, my seeds. Um, it did not work very well for me. <laughs> We weren't getting enough light in that room, so I'm going to change up my mediums. But a lot of folks will use these outside um, yeah. as a That's little way to season extension. Although they can be picked up quite easily, so you do need to tether them down. Yes, yes. Okay, I... Okay, that one's answered. 
Yeah, just one more thing. Um, Danielle apologizes for being, she says she's very 101. Don't apologize for that, Danielle. We all start somewhere. Um, do all seeds need to be germinated indoors? If I buy seeds during late spring and it's warm enough outdoors, is it okay to start them outdoors? That is a really excellent question. We actually did not That's touch a, on yeah. that. That's a great question. Yeah, I was just talking about starting seeds. Um, no, absolutely. You can start seeds outdoors. Um, you know, a lot of seeds, uh, they, they say to not start uh, indoors and not, you know, be, uh, beets root crop. Um, I've done it. Again, I, I like to go against the grain and I like to say, hey, I can do that too. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of things you want to direct so um, into your garden. And, and I mean, yeah, it, the only, the thing that this does is it allows us to start seeds um, and have plants for, we can, you know, it, well, number one, they're going to be healthier and happier just going into your garden. Um, but it, it allows us to do things like peppers and tomatoes that we hear it, it, it's cutting it close um, to, to really get a, a full harvest um, out of, because they're tropical plants. We don't stop to think about that. Um, but they, yeah, they're, they're tropical and, and they require, I have some peppers that are 180, 230 days, and there's just no way that I could grow them from the seed in my garden. Um, that being said, I've had a couple of volunteers that grew way better than anything I've ever started indoors. Um, but yeah, please start, start your seats. Take, take the information I've given you and, and start them, start them outdoors. And another great rule of thumb with that, Danielle, is the bigger the seed, the better they are for direct sowing outside, thinking of your squashes, your, some melons, your peas, and your beans. Um, those plants tend to not get as leggy and unhealthy looking as a tomato and a pepper that have their really tiny seeds. Um, they tend to just grow very robustly and their window between germination and harvest is a little bit smaller. And some of them are even okay to sow outside um, before you're past the last threat of frost, the seed is not really damaged by the frost as much. So you can sow them and just let them uh, take their course rather than sowing them inside, maybe needing to pot, pot them up before you're able to get them outside. So it's a lot of different factors. And uh, like Bethel said, it's all about you, your preference um, and gardening. It's all about experimentation, what you do really well. I probably don't do very well. I'm really bad at growing tomatoes. I'm awful at it. I want to be good at it, but it's all about experimenting. You might be good year to year. You might, you're going to have various levels of success, success. So don't give up and find what works for you. All right, if there's no other questions, um, again, thanks to Bethel for taking the time to put together this wonderful presentation. These materials will be going out to email um, probably tomorrow. So just keep your eye on your inbox for those. And if you have any questions, her email had popped up there. Um, it's gonna be on the resources and you're welcome to send questions my way as well. Have a great Thank evening, everybody. Much.